I've been highlighting hidden gems in my videos and a few people have asked me to make a full video in this style, so here I am. Today I'm going to tell you about some hidden gems that got released last week. But here's the thing, if you do enjoy these sort of videos, I'm going to ask you for something big up front. Don't skip ahead, this is going to take less than 30 seconds. I normally ask you to like and subscribe and you know, that's good for business. But I'm going to do something a little different and ask you to support my passion. It's a little tough to get these videos to do well with the YouTube algorithm. I do understand why and I'd like to talk about that in depth one day. But for now, there is one way you can help and that is to watch this video in its entirety. Some of us are here for certain genres or styles of games and we'll skip past the rest. That's more than understandable, so here's my deal to you. I'm going to do my best to make this more of a show and make the content interesting even if the game is not your style. And in return, I'm hoping that you can stick around till the end. Eventually I can do giveaways as well or keys sprinkled throughout, but I want to make sure you know why I'm doing that and that's to help these weird game recommendations videos do better in the YouTube algorithm. So yeah, that's my ask. Now let's get started with some dope games that came out last week. Today's feature is Weird West. Welcome to the Weird West. This is an immersive sim in the vein of Bioshock and Dishonored, but with an isometric perspective as in Fallout or Ultima games from the 90s. This game is by a new studio that was formed by former Arcane Studio producers, so they clearly have the chops in this genre. And it feels a little counterintuitive to say this, but I was surprised by how the isometric nature of Weird West offered a fresh perspective on the genre. I was able to look at my open-ended challenges differently. I could survey the whole area, walk the perimeter of the premises I was about to breach, put together a plan, and get about 15% through my carefully plotted plan before making a mistake and suddenly having to wing it. For what it's worth, not only can you save scum, but Weird West has a tooltip early on that basically encourages the act of save scumming. So it's your choice. You can either carry on and embrace the chaos or reload your quick save until you execute your plan perfectly. The point is that when this genre is shining at its brightest, it comes in part from your own ingenuity, or at the very least, the game's ability to hide the seams and let you feel like it was your own ingenuity. The more ways there are to solve a problem, the better, all while never allowing the challenge itself to feel too trivial. I'll give one example from the first few hours of how this could go down. My main objective is to find my husband who's been kidnapped by Midnight Marauders, led by their cannibalistic commander, Shelby Cross. As an aside, that sentence encapsulates the campy drama I'm loving about this game so far. In any case, I've been following their tracks for days from camp to camp and town to town. I'm told that a gentleman named Essex Mass was kidnapped alongside my husband and he would have the information I so desperately needed. Immediately upon arriving at his last known whereabouts, I witnessed a duel and I'm warned that the entire town is on edge. That duel was basically a hint that I could roast a gang member bad enough to bait them into a duel. That would be one way to breach their stronghold and rescue Essex Mass. But up to this point, I'd been enjoying stealth and even though there was no obvious way to get in quietly, I did find some second story windows I could enter if I could just find a way to climb up there. I gathered some barrels, stacked them up, and mistakenly crashed through the window, alerting everyone inside to my presence. I was in a tiny room, and they were naturally choked off at the doorway, so I picked them off one by one. I lost a member of my posse in the process, but in the end, I was victorious. And this is Weird West at its best, a balance between careful planning and using your agility to pivot when the plan doesn't go your way. There are times when I wish there were even more options on how to attack your goal, but it's possible that my own lack of creativity is to blame. And even if that's not the case, that just leaves more excitement for a potential sequel. Real quick, since this is a Steam Deck channel, let me tell you briefly about how it plays on the Steam Deck. It's rated playable and it's pretty clear why it's not verified. Gamepad controls work perfectly, but there wasn't a place to see what the buttons actually do or remap them. It also sometimes shows mouse and keyboard icons and by default it runs under 25 FPS. You have to bump down the graphics a bit to get it to 30 consistently. Now I did reach out to the devs about this and they said that they are working hard to get it verified in the coming weeks, so that's something to look forward to. Coromon is precisely what it says on the tin, a modern take on the classic monster taming genre. That is to say, if you love Pokemon, you are in for a treat with this one. Right off the bat, I like the customization options. 
For those of us of a certain vintage, this is something I think we universally wanted from our 16-bit RPGs. The ability to change outfits and accessories and see that reflected in our character sprite. So I like that the developers were able to craft these options for us and make them all look really good. In fact, you can tell a lot of good craftsmanship in general went into this game. They've animated details that just don't have to be there. Like there's an area in the beginning of the game where you go down to the lower floor and instead of just having normal stairs because that doesn't quite fit in a futuristic lab, they have an escalator and the escalator is animated. I know it's a small detail, but again, they didn't have to do that. These are the sort of things that show the effort the developers put into making a polished product. And so while there are these modern details that would have been hard to do on a retro system, this game is still very loyal to the Pokemon formula for better or worse. You might have to pray to RNG Jesus when it comes to evolving your monster. And more broadly, I've seen complaints that Coromon can get pretty grindy. That said, it's important to remember that Coromon has difficulty modifiers that you can apply to make the game easier. I know that's heresy to some people, but the option to make it less grindy and less RNG dependent does exist, so why not use it if those are issues for you? As for deck compatibility, my only complaint so far is surprisingly performance. On the Steam Deck, it doesn't reach 60 FPS despite not using the full power of the deck, and when I force 30 FPS, it kind of stutters. I've raised this with the developer and I do expect that they'll be addressing it. In a small corner of the video game world that you may not have heard of, there are logic puzzler fanatics, and we are all going crazy for one game. In prior years, it was Steven Sausage Roll, or Snakebird, or The Witness, or Baba Is You, but this year it's Patrick's Parabox. When I tell you this game slaps, and look, I know it's hard to make a block pushing game look cool in a video, but I just love how it manages to subvert my expectations and make my brain bend in ways I couldn't have imagined. There are times where I can feel my way to a solution, but I can't put into words what I just did. And that's because this game sometimes introduces heady mechanics. Recursion is the norm. The boxes you push around aren't just solid objects. You can enter them and exit them, and quite often you find yourself pushing around the block you're currently inside of or a clone thereof. And if you push it up against the wall, you may no longer have the option of leaving said block. Alternatively, and this is hard for me to put into words properly, but if you try to push the block you're inside of outside of itself, you can cause an inescapable paradox. According to the achievements, you can even cause a paradox of paradoxes. Of course, as is the nature for these sort of games, you can undo your last move or restart the puzzle altogether. Despite some of the mind-bending mechanics, however, Patrick's Parabox does an excellent job of onboarding. It introduces each new mechanic gracefully, each hub introduces something new, and the pattern is always the same. You look at the puzzle, bemused, wondering, well, how could that work? But the canvas itself is so tight that there are only so many ways you can push, and so you do just that. You start pushing, until you stumble upon the new mechanic of the hub, at which point you're off to the races. The hub has main levels you have to clear to proceed, and then harder optional challenges off to the side, and this formula really works for me. So far I've chosen to complete every puzzle I encounter, but when I get close to the end I could see myself skipping the optional challenge in a race for the credits. When it comes to deck compatibility, there are two very minor issues. For some reason the in-game button remapping doesn't work, and exiting the game doesn't work either. Both of these have really easy workarounds. Steam input works fine for remapping, and you can exit the game using the Steam menu easily. The developer is aware of both of these issues, so here's hoping for a fix. One of the reasons I'm so excited to make this video is because last week was low-key special when it came to small games. Each of the five new games I'm covering in this video are kind of genre specialists. Weird West as an immersive sim, Coromon as a monster taming RPG, Patrick's Parabox as a logic puzzler, and now Nightmare Reaper as a boomer shooter, or more accurately, boomer shooter roguelite. This game was in early access and last week they released the final episode now leaving early access in the process. It already had overwhelmingly positive reception and in its V1 state it really delivers. Usually with genre hybrids like this one, I'm happy if it delivers on just one of the requisite pieces. This could be a good boomer shooter or a good roguelite and either way I'd be happy. But but it's both, and better yet, it creates a good synergy between the two. Take the incredible weapon variety as an example. There are three types of shotguns, sawed off, pump action, and semi-auto. Those shotguns are just three out of the possible 80 types of weapons, but even within that, any weapon you find may be imbued with
with up to four modifiers out of a possible 30. So if you stumble on a gold shotgun, it might have a damage multiplier and an elemental effect and improve reload time. And of course, sometimes the modifiers can be negative. Having a weapon that has explosive rounds but pulls enemies towards you is a recipe for disaster. And each level has a bunch of weapon pickups. It's not uncharacteristic to get one to two dozen weapons in a single level. You only keep one at the end of the level, but you have a really good chance of getting something that feels overpowered, even though the difficulty still remains balanced. It's like Nightmare Reaper is balanced for pandemonium, which is great. There's a wonderful casino-like feeling to it all, but without any of the casino grossness. You're rewarded with a massive amount of coins and treasures and weapons, and even when things go wrong, it feels so cathartic that you don't feel bad about having to start over. And even with all that, I've kind of buried the lead. If you're a boomer shooter fanatic, you'll be happy to hear that this soundtrack is composed and performed by Andrew Holshow, who worked on Doom Eternal. Listen to this. Finally, I should point out that your in-game device that you use to manage your loot and skill tree and options is a Game Boy Advance SP, and it has Game Boy inspired minigames. The skill tree is a really competent Super Mario Land ripoff, there's a shmup and a Pokemon clone too. This game is really a joy, and if you're a fan of the genre, be sure to add it to your wishlist. The last genre specialist we have for today is Jitsu Squad. In the last few years, I have felt a renaissance of beat-em-ups with games like Ninja Saviors, River City Girls, Streets of Rage, and the upcoming Turtles game. Jitsu Squad fits in this slot nicely, and it's also a love letter to Capcom and other pop gaming culture from the 90s. There are so many references. In 10 minutes, I caught references to Final Fight, Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, Cartoonality, Perfect. X-Men, Aerosmith, not to mention a cameo from Maximilian Dude and a fourth wall moment where they reference the references. I genuinely don't know where the references end and the game begins. That could be perceived as a detriment if you had time to think about it, but this game moves at a rapid pace. The combat is deep, but you won't have to pull out your best moves 100% of the time. If I think back to Streets of Rage 4, that game required me to be more methodical the entire way, but there are segments in Jitsu Squad that are just chaos, and you can get away with just button mashing. I think this is the game's way of offering some pacing, so you're not operating at a high level the entire game. But then there are boss fights and more advanced encounters where you'll have to play tighter. You'll need to leverage your parries and use all of your resources to pull off a good performance. I'd like to add that the hand-drawn art and audio design all really shine on the Steam Deck hardware. When it comes to playability, I had no issues playing this and I would expect that this game will get deck verified. Alright, those are my 5 hidden gems from last week. I also wanted to include some games that were verified last week, but this video is already running longer than I expected. Naturally, if this video does well, I can do more like this and include verified games and things like that. If you like the idea of this video, but you think there are some things I can improve, feel free to let me know in the comments. Until next time, Deck Gang out. Goodbye!